And so this is the first uh, class that we'll do. We'll probably wrap up, I think June 11th is the last class. Don't worry, it's not every week. We'll do five <laughs> weeks here, take a couple weeks off. Do another five weeks, take a couple weeks off, do a couple there, break for Christmas, and then kind of do the same thing. Five on one, a couple off, five on one, a couple off. But we're doing this primarily because we're seeing so many people coming into the faith, and we don't want to take for granted uh, anything as people come in, as far as what they might believe, how they might hear a word like heaven or hell, and what that might mean to them that might be something totally different to the ancient Christians, to those timeless Christians that we call orthodox for right teaching. Or then maybe the word salvation means something totally different than they've been accustomed to in the tradition they grew up. Or love, love of God, or justice, or soul, or what a human being is. And so Father Andrew, uh, just who's an incredible priest, said, we got to do this for a full year. So here we are. So for those of you who are here for the first class, and I think most of us here have been in a lot of these classes before, uh, we say thank you. We're really excited Gregory of Nyssa, I'm going to do this a lot when we're talking today. You probably hear us throw out names and you're like, who is this person you're talking about? In this case, Gregory of Nyssa is this great uh, giant of the faith. Some of his nicknames are the pillar of orthodoxy, the father of fathers, you know, little stuff like that. He's a pretty big deal. And in the fourth century, what he says in a catechetical oration, this is his, we're going to talk about how we do catechism. Catechism just means according to the oral, so according to instruction. He says, be reminded that everybody who's coming into the tradition, everybody who's coming into this, all has the same aim of Christ. All of them have the same aim of love for God. But he says, you're going to have to instruct each one differently because each person is coming from a different background. In his case, he said, those coming from the Jewish tradition are not going to be the same as those coming from perhaps uh, the pagan or cultic traditions, or maybe those who are... Sibelians or modalists or different titles for different heresies. So our goal actually throughout this whole year is to try to hit each one of these things as we walk through it with the full knowledge and I think humility that we probably can't answer every question. But our goal would be that we would at least help to like bring people along into the faith and allow people if they do have questions to come and approach us. That's something else to know. If you're coming in from a different tradition, maybe a big mega church where the pastor is maybe difficult to get a hold of, and you just got a hold of deacons or from a larger church. In the Orthodox Church, you can grab a hold of your priest anytime. Um, that's not just me saying it because we're a welcoming community. You'll hear about these big giants we're going to talk about today, these great priests who even now theologians present. When you come from a different tradition, you go to hear these guys present, or some of these ladies, it'll shock you that they'll come to a small venue, or maybe maybe 50 people, then they'll sit down in the middle of it and pull up a tray beside you and just start talking about sports or the weather or whatever else. You're just shocked that you actually have access to this person who themselves is also married and has struggled through raising children. And so we want everyone here to feel they have access to, to us clergy. So please don't ever feel like because we're wearing all the, the cloth and stuff like that, that there's like a distance at all. I know Father Andrew has always been this way. It's how he kind of grew the, this community here. But even for me, I, I grew up in the Protestant tradition as well. I wasn't always publicly wearing black dresses. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump into it. I've got, I've got a few quotes here uh, on the front of this. I think hopefully you all are able to access this online. John, did this thing come through on the chat? Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd start with the very opening line. Uh, this is from this past week, actually. This is from earlier. This past Sunday, we actually read a letter from uh, Paul to the Galatians. But this is actually how the letter begins. He says, grace to you and peace from God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And then he jumps into this. He says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached. Let him be accursed. Strong language. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. It's strong. And of course, he says, for I neither received this from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. I use that kind of phrase specifically as the opening quote, 
because false gospel is about as is about as uh, art, well as you could articulate what sometimes is out there. False being not true and gospel being the good news. Not because people are meaning to be terrible or have some bad, you know, motivations, but false means this is not actually representative of the good news. Certainly not. And I know we're kind of having a heart, we're kind of going at them a little bit, but certainly not the idea that God is somehow so wrathful at us, he has to pour his wrath out on his son. This is nowhere in the pages of scripture at all. That's a false gospel. That's, that's not representative of who God is, and that's not representative of the good news is what it actually is. But even Paul, this early on in his letter to the, to the Galatians, there in modern-day Turkey, is saying, hold on to the gospel which was shared with you. It's, it's amazing, too, because you have to remember, Paul is down to stone people who are not holding on to circumcision, and now all of a sudden this whole world changes after that conversion. Another one, from the Didache, Didache the Lord's teaching to the twelve apostles to the nations, this text, they used to argue, probably came from maybe the second century, but now archaeological evidence seems to suggest that it might be as early as the year 100. See that no one calls you to err from this way of teaching, since apart from it, God teaches you. Whoever therefore comes and teaches you all of these things that have been said before, receive him. But if a teacher himself turn and teach another doctrine to the destruction of this, the one that we gave you, don't hear him. This, this should be encouraging, by the way, if this early on, the followers of Christ are trying to say, there's a lot of other Gospels out there. Pay attention to what we're telling you. St. Vincent of, of Lorraine, uh, moreover, in the Catholic, Catholicos, people in the West have this idea that Catholic means universal. That's not really what it meant. In the Greek, it meant according to the whole, Catholicos, the general thing. The Church itself... Uh, all possible care must be taken that we hold to the faith that has been believed. And here's the famous phrase, everywhere, always, and by everyone or by all. I'll say that again. That's an important thing. He says the faith that's been believed everywhere, always, and by all. That's a strong statement. That's fifth century, by the way. For that is truly in the strictest sense of the word, catholicos, complete and lacking nothing. And then, of course, we come to what the hermeneutical interpretive key of the whole thing is that we'll go through. It's Christ himself. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is, an, this is the important kind of first step for, for us as Orthodox Christians. I said this last night to the college students. Orthodoxy, we'll, we'll say it more specifically, Christianity Orthodoxy just means right teaching. It's kind of a Slavic interpretation moving backwards that we call it right worship. Sure, but right teaching is more uh, approximate. It's all about the person of Jesus Christ, and that's it. The clothes that the priest wears, the incense that we use, the way the building is done, how the icons are painted, our canon law, our councils, our scriptures, everything is about the person of Jesus Christ, and that's it. And so you can just begin to decipher early on the difference, and we'll talk about this today, between traditional and traditionalism. Because there is kind of a tendency that can happen as a person comes back to this faith, where they begin to want to hold on to the things that are not tradition or dogma as much as the traditionalisms, as the small things, as the cloth, as things like that. We're going to get into that more specifically. But everything we're talking about is about the person of Jesus Christ. And to that end, what the Orthodox would confess humbly, of course, is that they believe that the teachings of the Orthodox Church, the, the Church herself, is the most authentic expression of this Christ and has defended him for who he really is and how he really is. We do not say it to take away from anyone else, but that would be the conviction of the Orthodox faith. A visible Church established by God to represent him. And what a statement, right? And then those of us who enter into that, we call ourselves Christians, little Christs, uh, little anointed ones is what that word means. As, as we jump into this to bring everything back to Christ, the, the very first class we wanted to have is going to be dry and rather dull, but we think really important. And that is we feel the need to say before we set out in any task, George, who's here, uh, basically everything in this place that runs because George somehow fix it, fixes it and makes sure it doesn't fall apart. Before he'll do a task, he make he has to make sure he has the right tools for it. That's usually what's when he comes in and I or Father Andrew mess something up. George realized he had the wrong tools and kicking it doesn't work. The right tools are important. And so 
as people come into the Orthodox faith, we want to say something that we think is important, which is we want to say, here are the sources where we should be going to understand this faith. And then perhaps here are some sources where we need to kind of guard ourselves a little bit and go, okay, maybe there's something good here, but this might not be everything. Or maybe there's something good here, but perhaps not everything this person is saying is actually indicative of the whole church. If y'all are following, because there are some personalities, God bless them, who are out there, who are not blessed by bishops to be doing what they're doing, who call themselves priests, who do not have the blessing to be a priest, who say what they say is orthodox, and it's really not. It's really their own opinions and how they feel, and they've got, you know, a microphone and TV, and so they're saying it. And so our concern would be if we're going to be, you know, just humble shepherds, which is, you know, what a pastor is, is we want to guard people as they come into this tradition to kind of keep them healthy and say, some of the stuff you're hearing out here, we're not going to say totally don't listen to it, but be really on guard about what that person is saying. There's a wide lane for the Orthodox tradition, a large, mysterious one. We just want to put people on guard as they come into this, because we don't want anybody to get a person who might mean well, but is teaching falsehoods or things that are completely not Orthodox, even if they say, well, this is Orthodox, which is typically what you hear them say. So then the question will be, as we start today, what are the sources of truth and where can we go to get a better and fuller understanding of this tradition? The first one, rather shockingly, I'm sure, is Jesus Christ himself. This, this, by the way, will seem like the most Sunday school answer of all time. My son's already geared up for this. He already knows when he comes home. How was Sunday school? Jesus, that's accurate, son. But, you know. There are certain theologies that some people will propose, whether they're, especially those, a lot of us are in this room. I don't know if you come from a different tradition. Like me, you can put your hand up. I don't know if anybody here is not Orthodox from their birth. Yeah, it's a lot of us in this room, most of us. Um, a lot of what brought us here is we finally had the sense, this is the truth. This was the real source. And we say that without condemning our past or condemning the people around us, but we go, here is the fullness of the faith that I was always looking for. Finally. Something that represents the mystery and sophistication of God. Something that is fitting of his beauty and his majesty. Something that is perfectly humble and articulate and revealing and at the same time mysterious. This, this whole thing is in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the hermeneutical key to understand everything. There's a little saying among theologians, the old Adam in the scriptures in Genesis is not the key to understand either the Old Testament or the New Testament, those Hebrew scriptures or the new writings. But the new Adam, Jesus Christ, is the key, the interpretive key to read all of the Hebrew scriptures and to see everything in the world. To that end, and we'll talk about this as we go throughout this course this year, there are certain theologies that we see in the West and some that have even popped up on the periphery of orthodoxy that we reject as the Orthodox Church, because what we say is we say, this fails the test of Jesus Christ. This is not representative of who he is, what he accomplishes on the cross, what his heart is, what his identity is, how he acts in the world, and what his mission is. And if it should fail the test of the person of Jesus Christ, then we go with hell. And it's really that simple. It's, it's, it's it, you know, because it can be a very difficult faith sometimes to get it to, to kind of approach, but it's really that simple. Everything that we're about to hear, everything we experience in the course of worship, all of it is revealed in the person of Christ and is meant to be a revelation of the person of Christ. All of this, in fact, is meant not to be an exercise to understand the person of Christ, but an actual encounter with him. So much so, we'll talk about this later in the year, the priest in the liturgy, his job isn't to represent Christ in his absence. That's a misunderstanding of symbolism. Proper symbolism is that the priest is there to represent Christ, reminding us that his presence is. The only way we can do it is if the whole community comes around, we have somebody lay hands on us, and they basically vest us and dress us and go, yeah, you're going to do this. <laughs> this, is, this is your job now. You have no other vocation but this vocation. Everybody else, all of us here as Christians are meant to be priests. But they look at their clergy and go, and your vocation is to have no other vocation but that vocation. That's going to be a great conversation we have later when we talk about how we are not, we don't think like in clerical ways like the West does. That's, that's not how we think. 
you don't have some weird idea that somehow the kleros, me, I'm super holy, and everybody else are the lay. You've often heard that term. Well, lay is just short for laus to theu. We're all part of the people of God. That's it. That's it. So the hermeneutical key is Jesus Christ himself. And everything that goes on and all the things that we study can only be understood through the person of Christ. I, I know it's kind of a thing to hit ad nauseum and it seems like a pretty obvious statement, but it's, it's the most important thing. There was a great interview with Father Tom Fitzgerald, um, who a, 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 was one of the deans at the graduate school for the seminary in Boston. Uh, Armenian in his background, he's an extraordinary guy, uh, Orthodox theologian in his own right. And during this interview, they kept asking him, what is orthodoxy? And he said, it's just Christ. Well, what's it about? It's about Christ. What are you meant to teach us? Jesus Christ. And you, you can see him. he's got a wonderful sense of humor. He's very humble. He's like, That's it. And he goes, if any of it becomes a distraction, we need to relearn, what is this here for? Is, is this, you know, is this representative of Christ? That will guard us from, from creating false and silly theologies or speculative theology or falling into things that are just completely not representative of who he is. For instance, kind of going back to the sinners in the hand of an angry God, that totally misrepresents Jesus Christ. That's not who he is. That's not what he says on the cross. That's not how he acts to people. That's not his mission when he goes into Hades. That's not who he is at all. The other place, the source of the sources of truth that we go to are, and this can be new for people, is the church herself. It's the ecclesia, the calling out ecclesia, the calling out of the people of God. And now we continue on to become something together that we cannot be separately. In the church is where we find the source of truth. We know, um, well, it depends on the theologian you read. Here's the mystery of, of Christianity. We'll talk about on that holy day of Pentecost, you know, this, the Holy Spirit descends these flames like tongues of fire above the disciples. You know, thousands are converted by Peter's teaching, the Pentecost. And you'll, we'll kind of say in shorthand, there's the beginning of the church, the birthday of the church. But this is actually untrue. If you read every church father, what they'll say is the church was there before the foundations of the world. It's a pretty cool thing. And that upon those foundations, we have the whole universe. And the church was also some, somehow timelessly there by God. But this is an important statement to make because for those who are coming into the Orthodox Church, what we're about to say after this about scripture, about tradition, about canons, councils, saints, martyrs, spiritual fathers, feasts, liturgical, da da da, that is all not something separate from the church, but are all things that actually grow out of the life of the church. So, like the Holy Scriptures, we'll talk about just in the New Testament writings from Paul. We don't believe the Bible is a Quran that fell out of the sky, and we just do whatever it says, submit. This, this, these texts and scrolls grew out of the life of the church. They grew out of a worshiping community. They grew out of a place where people were being martyred and killed. And of course, we know, and everybody does in this room, that order of books that you see in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you know, John, Acts, he goes on, it's not in chronological order. I mean, the first book we probably have in the New Testament is probably Thessalonians, almost certainly. So we have to understand that these texts that we're reading, they grow out of the life of the church. They're informed by the church, by a church who's constantly in contact with Christ, formed and informed him, by him, led by the Holy Spirit. And what grows out of it are these scriptures. It's the same thing with the people of Israel. The Torah, God's instruction, the Pentateuch, those first five books, the law, the Psalms, the prophets, they don't just fall out of the sky, but they grow out of a living tradition. They grow out of a faith of God. They don't just appear from somewhere else and all the people gather and go, we found this book in the desert, let's just do what it says. And it's interesting because it can almost kind of scare people, but when you read some of these books, um, when you find out, oh my gosh, so this, this verse may have been added on, and all of a sudden you feel that sense of terror, like... <gasps> And you look at the Orthodox and they go, oh, yeah, we knew that from the very beginning. It was probably written at this time by this guy at this place. But that's because he was a disciple of him. They all knew each other. And that's why they did it there. Yeah. And you immediately go, oh, okay, you guys already, you know this. Well, I found this lost gospel. It's not lost and it was never gospel. We've known about it from the very beginning. Here's a person who writes about it. Here's why it's dismissed. Da, da, da. All of this grows out of the life of the church. Right. And so when we think of church, we think about it primarily as a place for encounter with God. It's the vehicle by which we have this interaction with God. Now, 
The Holy Spirit is everywhere present and filling all things. Just holding on to that, we're trying to become, in some sense, not just people encountered with God, but maybe systematic theologians. Holding on to that statement, which is the only prayer that we have to the Holy Spirit directly in our services, Heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, run that to its logical end, and you find yourself in almost scandalous territory. Everywhere present, in all people, the good and the bad, in heaven and in Hades? Well, yeah, there's no clauses to it. We'll talk about that later in the year, too. It's communal, the church. For those of you who might have been out at our church for the first time these past few Sundays, especially this past week, you saw a bunch of kids who are here. And there's a cacophony of them going on. Please, I'll just point this out. Anybody who's online, anybody who's here, when the priests are giving a homily and the kids are making noise, please don't feel the need to feel bad for us. Father Andrew raised three boys. As a matter of fact, I was just at his house this weekend, and he showed me a spot where one of them, well, two of them wrestled through a wall to get into the other room. It's a really famous story. Ask Father Andrew about it sometime. And I've got two little boys. The sound of children in church is way okay. It's when us adults are making noise, we should probably do better. Uh, one of our friends, Diane Christius, she's in Greece right now. She's a wonderful woman in this parish. She sent us a video. She's at this, you know, huge and ancient church in, in Greece. Gorgeous. I mean, ornate, beautiful. The priest is doing it. And it's right after the priest comes out. We have a deacon in training here so he can appreciate this. Now and forever into the ages of ages, amen, before he goes to put the gifts back in. And Diane Christie has sent me this video. It's absolutely beautiful. And as this priest in this gorgeous cathedral is saying this, right in front of him, you see a five-year-old just run across the front of the church. That's okay. It's a temple. John Chrysostom had to write homilies. I don't say it's just to scandalize people. He had to, say, tell, he had to tell his deacons, stop kissing your girlfriends in the back of the church. The people were bringing their animals in. Please stop leaving them out in the narthex. That's not appropriate. The people would cheer for him and sometimes boo him when he gave homilies. So we in America, we have pews in there because of this kind of Kantian notion further developed. It's not Kant's fault that we actually can sit in plush, comfortable chairs. And how we work out our salvation is hearing something here. And you kind of see this in the whole Western tradition, you know, in long homilies and things like that. But in the Orthodox churches, there were no pews. The whole thing was a temple. It was a space you moved around. You asked for forgiveness from people. And if you go overseas, it's still like that. They might have stasidia, seating along the walls, maybe for people who need it, maybe some chairs up front for people who have earned the right to sit down after 70 or 80 years. But the rest of it is a space that's just open for movement. So this church is communal. And in that sense, is how we work out our salvation. Gosh, you guys, there's so much we're going to talk. It's so beautiful. Because salvation happens in a community. There's a Russian saying that says, the only thing a man can do alone is perish. And if we're going to be rescued, we have to be rescued altogether. When you want to talk about scandalous statements, Gregory of Nyssa will say, the image and likeness of God isn't one or two human beings. It's every human being who has ever or will ever exist. And all of them together are the image and the likeness of God. That's his bride. Again, run that to its logical conclusion, and you find yourself also going, wait a second, how did, how did salvation, we'll get to that. It's a visible church. We're not saying that it's, that it's not an invisible church, but Christ establishes a visible church. And by the way, for those who are coming in, I, I feel the need to say all this just to kind of keep it from being too scandalized. When anybody comes in, they go, I got to tell you, I've heard about some of these Orthodox bishops and they're fighting about everything and who's in charge of who and they're shouting at each other. And this guy wants to excommunicate that guy. If you, if you look around and you notice... Some of the uh, Orthodox who've been lifelong say Spiro over here, and you'll notice that they're not shaking at all. It's because they realize that the bishops, God bless them, we need them, but all of us have been acting this way since the Last Supper. Who's the best? Who's the worst? Who sits at your right hand? Who's going to betray you? Nothing's changed. That's okay. We don't need to be scandalized by it. But there is a community that's established that Paul talks about in the book of Acts, that you have presbyters, that you have servants, that you have episcopos, head servants of the house. Did you have elders, presbyters? We'll talk about that later. And then the other scandalous text that you find from the second century is we know where the church is, but we don't know where it isn't. That's also a really cool statement. We'll come back to that later when you're still on it. <clears throat> the church is a guide. <clears throat> we cannot do it alone. We really cannot. And <clears throat> John Chrysostom, among others, 
will talk about this as a danger where people will try to will themselves to be some kind of a perfect version. <laughs> They'll think by their own gumption, I'm going to figure out, I'm going to pull my bootstraps and I'm going to be perfect and holy. And I think it was, gosh, I'm forgetting now who the saint was. But the way he writes almost sounds like a modern writer. He says, very often when we're doing that, God is off in a corner just waiting for us to finally get tuckered out or defeated enough, we just fall down. He goes, are you done trying to do it without me? Let's do this together. And it requires a whole community. It requires people we confess to, persons to whom we're accountable. It requires people that we struggle with. Another great story of a, a monk who uh, was at a monastery. He was basically an alcoholic. Really didn't do his prayers at all. He was a mess. And the old Yerunda, which just it means old man, but in a venerable way, not in a mean way, is on his deathbed. He calls for this young monk. Some of you heard this story. And all the other monks are going, this is great. This guy's about to get it. This holy man on his deathbed's about to be like, look at fella, you know. And instead, when this young monk comes up, the elder grabs both of his hands and kisses them. And he says, it's because of you that I know God. It's because of you that I had to pray. And we laugh because we're going, in other words, this guy's saying, your frustration made me pray. But that Yerunda didn't see it that way. He saw it as his salvation. We need one another. We need our spouses and our children. We need these crosses to save our lives. And they do that. They make us true human beings. The church is herself an authority, not just in a hierarchical sense where we have bishops, but in a conciliar sense. We'll talk about this later in the year about councils. There's a lot of, we say there's seven ecumenical councils. But to those who are here, you go, wait, but well, there's also a council in Acts that you're not counting there. There's a few other councils in between. I know there's some councils, uh, councils that got kind of thrown out, like the famous robber council. That one's probably not going to make it if you're calling it a robber council. Well, how did those become accepted is primarily that way. The bishops decide this through prayer and struggle. And then it's, do the people accept it? Is this representative of the faith? And these seven councils are that. In the churches where you have saints and martyrs and the church's teachings, I'm going to pause for a moment to say something that I think is important. When a person comes into this the Orthodox Church, though, we'll get to this too as well, they can fall prey to reading things that the fathers and mothers will say in the church as proof texts. Oh, this father said it, so that's that. This is not at all how we do theology in the Orthodox Church. Uh, and for instance, there are countless stories, say, for instance, of Cyprian of Carthage, who I've actually got quoted here. He had certain ideas about things that everybody said, no, that's, that's not it. It's this kind of conciliar way through which things work. The saints and the martyrs are themselves the foundations of the church. Okay, yes, because not because of who they are, but because of who Christ is. These martyrs reveal to us Christ in the way that they witness to him, even if they have to die. And these have been a part of the church from the very, very beginning. And so all the stuff you see, this community, this hierarchical and conciliar reality, this bride of Christ who's blameless and meant to grow into that, the saints and the martyrs, the members of it, this is the vehicle by which we, uh, we become uh, the bride of Christ together. And I finished that part with this quote from St. Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. This is good. Whether by word or our epistle. This is important. For those of you who are coming from a tradition that maybe didn't do the body and blood of Christ, there was definitely a time when we did not have all these books of the Bible in the New Testament. But there was never a time the assembly got together and did not have body and blood of Christ. There was never a time the assembly got together and did not have the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. And that's a wild thing to think about. Because very often we think is scripture falls out of the sky, the church builds itself around it, and later they adopt this. But that's not true at all. This sacrifice, this korban, which we'll talk about later, instituted by Christ, is there from the beginning. And it's out of those assemblies that we have these letters of the New Testament and these writings about the experience of Christ. But what Paul says is hold fast to the paradusi. A great guy, if you're looking for somebody, who can I listen to? Who's really good about orthodoxy? John Baer is just a giant. He was taught spirituality by a guy named Elder Saffroni, or St. Saffroni. He's a pretty big deal in our church. He was taught how to do theology by Callistos Ware, Timothy Ware, who's also a giant, uh, who passed not too long ago. Uh, Takis Macritis knows him, or knew him in, when he's at Oxford. And then he was taught how to be a pastor by Thomas Hopko. Yeah. That's quite a pedigree to have. 
And he's an incredible theologian. He's a guy who I'd say to, to read and listen to. But he says, what Paul says here is the word paradusi, which is actually a verb. It's paradusi. It's what I tradition to you. And the question will be, well, Paul, what are you traditioning to us? And he says, precisely what I saw Christ do. But Paul doesn't have that interaction with Christ, does he? Not in his earthly ministry. Paul even says, it's a harsh word to Paul, says, Paul says, I was a person untimely born. Actually, what he says in the strict, this is the word he says, I was an abortion. I was not there. I was not there at the time to see him in his earthly ministry. So what Paul receives is that tradition of the, the, the apostles, of the gathering together, of the breaking of the bread, of the opening of the Hebrew scriptures, also the opening of the Psalms, of the experience of the road to Emmaus, this matrix of scripture and of the, the breaking of the body and blood. That's what Paul traditions to them. And those worshiping communities, he goes about writing letters to. So it's out of this church. This church becomes an authority for us. And so I say that because you might encounter people who go, well, the church says this. But what I think, in my opinion, and you're going easy, Barney Fife, look, know it like you have your own opinion, but this has to be grounded, has to be grounded in the church. Scripture and holy tradition grow out of the church. This is a very big thing for us. By the way, I put this in here because I, I felt bad about picking on Cyprian of Carthage. We were talking about him earlier in the, in the second century. Yeah, in the second, third century. Cyprian of Carthage basically starts saying, you know what we should do is people who come into the church, even if they've been baptized elsewhere, we should be baptizing them. And then he gets letters from Rome and Alexandria, and they're going, what is this brand new invention that you've got going on, Cyprian? This is not how we do things in the church. And God bless them, it's... But more well known that he eventually does go, okay, yeah, you guys are right on this one. But here, I, I didn't want to be mean to him, so I put this great quote, Antiquitus non es veritas. Anybody who did their Latin in high school could say that better than I could. But Cyprian of Carthage is there responding to Rome, who is trying to say that they're allowed in Rome to interfere in other people. I mean, after all, Clement of Rome is one of the earlier bishops there. He writes letters to the Corinthians, and they're saying, we've always done this. This is the old tradition. The Supreme goes, yeah, well, just because it's old doesn't make it right. <laughs> and so all the stuff we're talking about here isn't just because it's old. It's not traditionalism. It's that it's a living tradition, a breathing tradition. And that goes for Scripture as well. When we talk about Scripture, and this is going to be so much fun for those of you coming from a biblical background and a biblical church, this is where orthodoxy, in my opinion, as far as theologically, just shines. I, I was surprised when I came into the Orthodox Church to say something, I'll just confess myself. For as many times as I'd read the Bible, I'd never read the Bible. And I came into a church that finally understood the Bible, and I went, my gracious, this is finally how you read the Bible. How did I miss this text and that text? And how did I misunderstand this? And this is the tradition of the Bible that wrote the Bible, from which the Bible grew. These New Testament, you know, and, and, and uh, the Psalms and things like that from before it. Even though you say it's from the foundations of the world. We'll talk about that at a different time. So understanding the scriptures as a source, but understanding as they're originally written. We talked on Sunday about a mistake that Augustine makes because he doesn't know how to read Greek. There's some evidence to suggest that as a child, he tried to study it, but he didn't like it. So if anybody hears a Greek school dropout, you have sympathy from Augustine. But because of that, he misunderstands some of the text. He has this idea of inherited guilt. In other words, that the seed of man passes along this inherited guilt of what Adam did in the garden. This is not scripture. And if you want proof of it, why in the world for the Jews and all their long tradition, why don't they ever believe this idea? Never suggested by the Jewish tradition, never suggested by the Christians in the East. And as I understand it, the first time anybody hears about this in the East is, if I understood it correctly, it's Photios in the 10th century. And he says, this is a wild heresy. And I believe it's, I believe it's him. He says, this is a blasphemy against God as creator and against his whole salvific plan. So scripture and holy tradition, these are authorities but understood rightly. And very often, this is the great gift of people who maybe have grown up in this tradition, is they've read it in the original languages. Uh, George Miller in our office here, George is uh, also at the Antiochian House of Studies, uh, is a theologian in his own right, even though he'll roll his eyes and not believe that. We were talking about people can go, yeah, but I know I, I've had my pastor read the Bible in Greek. He went to a Bible college, they taught it in Greek. What you very often find there, though, and this is not trying to shoot anybody down, but this tends to be what happens, is that that was the only text that they read, which means the translations that they saw were given to them by somebody. 
Are you following me? So the words that were there, they were told, this is what this means, this is what this means. And in some of the subtle nuance, because on the whole, they're learning it well, but the subtle nuance is almost everything. It's important, like a lot of times when you talk to like, uh, you know, church theologians who are actually really smart guys, they're able to say, yeah, we know what this word means. You go, well, why? Well, you can read pagan literature in the first century too, and this is how they wrote. And this is how the church fathers wrote a couple centuries after that. Here we have letters that are written just before the time of Christ. They're able to take that word and see how else is it being employed everywhere else around. They have a grasp of it. So learning it in its original language is important. It is the word of God. We don't fall prey to this idea. Anybody here is familiar with this? Inerrantism. Has ever heard this before? Scripture is inerrant. It's perfect the way it fell down, the way it's come down to us. We understand that word differently. It's not to say that it's full of error, but there are certain accounts that seem to contradict one another. For instance, Judas' death. One says that he spills his guts in the field. The other one says that he hangs himself. Now, you can kind of bring these two together. You can try to understand this. But the purposes of the scripture is not that they're a Quran. We're not to make an idol out of them. We're not reading. It's not four gospels. It's one gospel, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is still the hermeneutical key to even understand scriptures. These are four accounts of one gospel. So understand the scriptures, but... You know, it's not traditionalism, it's not just history, and it's not meant to be read as a history textbook. These scriptures are something altogether different, and they're, they're telling us something about the person of Jesus Christ. And which you'll probably hear whenever you talk to any great theologian, which will help everybody feel better who might come from a Protestant background, because they're always going to say, go back to the sacred scriptures, always go back to the scriptures, always go back to the scriptures. All these great theologians that we tend to celebrate on Sundays or weekdays or in our church, do the scriptures inside and outwards, forward and back. Yeah. How do you the church view um, deuterocanonical books for like the longer average of the canon? Yes, the church has a, like, a vast opinion on these, as well as apocryphal writings. There's a whole host of things. The Book of Enoch is another thing that people kind of look into as well. I don't know if you're probably familiar with it. Uh, the Book of Enoch is something you can tell Peter probably had a pretty good grasp of when he's writing his stuff. The church will say all of this can be edifying to read, uh, and maybe not all of it is necessary to read. I don't know if that makes sense at all. So some of it can help to inform certain parts of a person's theology, but some parts of it they would say, in time, like know these other things first and then go about reading those more, uh, not apocryphal, uh, but something like that uh, in Scripture. And for sure, the Orthodox, you would say, have more books of the Bible than others. Worship and prayer, this is how you kind of ground the whole thing, uh, is in the worship and prayer. And really, this the best way to summarize this is you can tell how a husband feels about his wife, not by what he says about her, but by how he actually treats her. I can say all kinds of things about my wife. She's wonderful, she's perfect, and I love her. Do you ever see her? <laughs> Do you take her on dates? Definitely not. Do you sleep in the same room? No, I actually live three streets down from her. He said, I don't think... What you're saying is matching up exactly with what you're what you're doing. The church in her worship reveals exactly what she thinks and how she feels. So in the worship is where we really come to understand what is the opinion of the church. Now, it's a, there's an important caveat here is to say, when you listen to some of the hymnography, some of the hymnography comes along pretty late. You say 7th and 8th century even, right? Even after Romanos? Yeah, some of the stuff comes along later. And so for that purpose, you can read into it and you kind of go, this doesn't seem entirely historically accurate. And you can go, that's probably quite right. Or it doesn't seem theologically precise. Right. So you even have to take sometimes some of that and go, how do I ground it in the person of Christ, ground it in the scriptures, ground it in understanding? Is this just a poetic perspective on this? Or is this meant to be dogma? But ultimately, the church in her worship is where she articulates everything that she actually feels. And that's liturgy, which is the two things we'd have, which is to be Eucharistic, thankful, and doxological, worshipful. Any, any time, by the way, especially if you talk to a priest like Father Andrew, who's been around for a long time, how do I learn about orthodoxy? How do I grow in this? He'll say, what's your prayer life? I'm still a young priest, so I start pulling books off the shelves and quoting things. And he goes, no, 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 no. Begin with the prayer life, and we'll get there. Um, and he does this with everybody who comes into the church. I'm sure, Chloe, you probably have memories of this, too. He'll go straight to Father Jacob scratching his head and pulling down texts and books. 
And the wise sage that he is, he comes by and says, ask how the person's prayer life is, start there and work our way up. And I go, oh, oh yeah, of course, that's. But I feel like I should add one more thing to scripture that I mentioned last night to the kids before we go on. We're almost there for questions. It was, it was to a great, it redounded to our great benefit, I think in a lot of ways, that scriptures were broken down into chapters first, and then I think in modern day England, it's broken down into verses by one of the archbishops there in the West. That's been helpful for us because you can find text much easier. But there's also been a bit of a problem with that, is that people, especially I grew up in the Western tradition, we do this. We use it now as proof texts. We're almost like lawyers. Well, this text says this in this way, and so that's it. And the Orthodox would say, oh, we got a problem now. Because this would be the equivalent. You can't understand the full letter if you're just taking a proof text out. If you remove all the chapters and verses and just read the letter, then you have a better understanding. The Orthodox call this scopos, the whole scope. That's how it has to be understood. I think we joked about one time, it'd be like if people came across a letter that you put chapters and verses to, a letter that I wrote to my wife, and I called her, you know, a, a pumpkin. You know, I love you, pumpkin. And a thousand years later, they go, <laughs> he thought she was a fruit. So clearly not an intelligent man. No, you have to read it in the whole course of, of, of the scopos. Because if anybody knows how to quote scripture and get everything right, it's Satan. And that's what he actually uses when he's tempting Christ. Everything he's saying to him is scriptural, but Christ has a response for it. So it's understanding the whole scopus of scripture, because you can pick out anything to prove anything. And very often, almost any text you find, there's something else that kind of, you know, puts it in order. I think there's one about if you have an offering on the altar, go and apologize to this person. The stuff that's said in there, and they said, and if they won't hear your, you know, if they won't hear your apology, get one of the elders, get some people else to witness to this. And if they don't accept the apology, Treat them as sinners and tax collectors. And then you go elsewhere in scripture, and how are we supposed to speak, you know, treat sinners and tax collectors and persons in prison and hungry people, our enemies? Love them too. We have to put it all in context, though. So what's the whole scope of scripture? Councils and creeds. It's really it's the first council we have in Acts. It's a pretty big one. It's what's I mean, what a statement. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Good Lord. I mean, that, that talk about command. In the creeds and councils, and we'll talk about this in the creed, which grows out of the Nicene and Constantinopolitan uh, first couple councils, you have their dogmas, definitions, and doctrines of the church. Now, the, for a person who goes, well, I don't like this because the church isn't supposed to be doctrinal. Well, if anybody here has ever said, I believe in Jesus Christ, you've just said the most fundamental doctrinal statement of your life. Jesus Christ is everything. That's the most fundamental doctrine that there is. It is. There are always these kind of things. And it, um, we'll talk about the seven ecumenical councils, how they meet, what it's about. But going back to our first point, every single council was trying to answer one question. Who do we say Jesus Christ is? And what eventually happens is heresies will arise. They gather together a few hundred or several hundred bishops, and they have it out. And usually what they jump into is scripture and what's been handed down to them and what they see in the worship. And they usually come back to, this is who Jesus Christ is. And this is why his teaching is either false or approved. Take, for example, the Third Ecumenical Council, which we'll get into later. But it was a popular tradition among the early Christians to call Mary the Theotokos, the mother of God, the God-bearer, right? You're the mother of God, yeah. And people began to go, well, wait a second. How can you say Mary's bearing God, you know? And they say, well, we shouldn't call her that name. Well, isn't he God and isn't he man? And then some bishop, thinking that he was doing the right thing, as, as a lot of us parents try to do when our kids are wrestling, as we go, let's just call her the Christotokos and call it a day. She's the mother of Christ. Are we all on the same page about this? But as that began to spread, the church fathers said, no, no, this is an issue. Because everything about this tells us who Jesus Christ is. Is he really fully God, and is he really full God, truly God, begotten before all ages? Is that who he is from the beginning? There's not some later point when a dove descends and then he becomes God. He was always him, or wasn't he? So they end up going, this is true God of true God, always. That's the mother of God. And so the name Theotokos is as much about her as it really is about Christ, which is why in the tradition where Paul paints the icon of him in his incarnation, she's holding him, pointing at him which is really neat. So everything in those, those councils and dogmas is always about who Christ is. The danger here, often for young men this can happen, is it turns into sophistry. 
well, here's what this council said, and here's what I heard, and according to this council and this translation, and this person said this and this, this we're, we're outside of orthodox. I don't know where we're going now. And now we're just having empty philosophical conversations. It's like this is all about the person of Jesus Christ. Not to say we can't have those discussions. Those are really fascinating and fun. But it comes back to the person of Christ. Within those councils and creeds, you have canons. And, and this is something that just kind of give us a heads up on. You'll, we'll come across these later in the year. By the way, you all are being magnificent because this is a really dry lecture. So I really appreciate you all hanging in there. Um, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. If anybody's ever heard, ever seen Ricky Gervais ever host one of those awards, which is genuinely funny, highly inappropriate, of course. Probably not something to preach should ever bring up when he's giving a talk for catechumens. But I think at the very beginning of it, he was like, and now the first of the first award. That's very often how a priest feels when he's hearing his own voice. So for you all enduring hearing a priest speak, God bless you. But canons, this is something we're going to talk about later on. Canons. There is, there is an unhealthy way in which people have taken these canons and they've begun to read them as legal documents and using legalese have said, this canon says this and therefore this. This is also a misuse of the canons. The canons are not commandments. Even canon means a rule. It's like a guide. And the purpose of those canons was meant to be medicine. And it's interesting because uh, St. Paisios, who a lot of people enjoy talking about, he's a recent saint, died on Mount Athos, so I think it's in the 90s, George? Really recent. I believe in his early career, what he did as a monk career, his vocation, his life, is when people came to him, he would just consult the canons. I think he had the, the rudder, which is a collection of a bunch of canons. And he'd say, okay, it says you've done this, so you need to do this, no communion for eight years. See you later. And in one account, a young man comes back to him. He sees him on the Holy Mountain. He says, how are you doing? Are you working through this repentance? And the guy goes, eight years? No. And I'm 20. I'm going back to my life. I'm doing my thing. I'll see you whenever. And what strikes Paisios in this paraphrase, but not untrue story, is he begins to go, maybe I've misapplied these canons. And you start going all the way back to John Chrysostom, after whom our liturgy is named, also in the 4th century. He's at the end of the 4th century. And he talks about a priest. The purpose of these canons, he says, in confession and things like this, is he goes, a spiritual father, which is the last thing we'll talk about today, is like a doctor. And he says, when a doctor has to take care of somebody who has, say, a wound or an infection, he has to be careful that he doesn't cut too shallow into the wound or cut in the wrong place. Because what will happen is he'll never get the infection out, and it will only get worse, and the person could die. But he also has to make sure that he does not cut too deep into the person and cause an even greater wound, and also cause the possibility of a person to die. He said a proper physician has to know how to cut, in which way to cut, with what strength to cut, how to pull out this venom, and how to heal the person. The purpose of the canons are there not so much to be a rule where we go, says you did this, you're out. But in a lot of ways, they speak to a particular place and a particular time. I think I even put that quote in here. Yeah, thanks to George, who's uh, recently sent this over to me. Well, I'll read that one later. But it's about an application. The purpose of the cans are there to help us to realize how to get a person on their way. And what's interesting is a lot of times the very people who say, the cannons aren't following all the cannons. Uh, Father Thomas Hopko, blessed memory, he was the dean of systematic theology. You're going to hear priests bring his name up a lot when you give homilies. And you're probably wondering, who is this guy? These guys keep bringing up Father Hopko, Father Hopko. He would tease bishops because one of the cans is a person cannot be a bishop unless they have completely memorized the entire book of the Psalms. Wow. And so to tease them, because he's the dean of systematic theology, whenever a bishop would say, you know what the canons say, Hopko, who himself had, you know, a huge pedigree, everybody knew he was, he would apparently just pat him on the arm and go, okay, let's hear it, go. Bless is the man not swat, not swat in the way of the council. Let's go, go, let's get the whole thing, rattle the whole thing off. And the bishops, of course, would be like, all right, all right, Thomas, all right, we get it. So a lot of times people will say the canons, the canons, the canons. The canons are meant for a particular place in a particular time for the purposes, not of punishment, but very often of helping a priest understand things. For instance, there's a very strict canon of a person that's ever killed someone, say a soldier at war. I think the canon says there's no communion for 10 years. Now, you can imagine if you're a priest that somebody's just come back from Iraq or Afghanistan. The last thing you do to a person who's been through god-awful hell and bloodshed is to go, man, you're not going around the church for the next 10 years. See you later, pal. That is a complete misunderstanding of the canons. 
In some ways, it helps the priest instead of going, hey, buddy, you're going to be all right. Come in next Sunday. Let's do this. It, 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 it causes the priest to tarry for a moment. And he goes, he's looking at us and he's going, oh, man, what this person has been through is some serious stuff. I'm not meant to look at this and go, okay, this is what you know it says on the McDonald's menu. It's 10 years. And I'm also not supposed to say it doesn't matter. This holds me to this person needs real therapy and real care and real confession and real patience. And we want to get him back to partaking of the body and blood of Christ. But we don't want to rush him back to it or make him think that it's flippant and we don't care. This person needs real healing for the sacrifice they've made, sadly, in the world we live in to protect us. So the canons is not meant to be used for sectarian stuff. It's not about rigorous mindset. It's not legalism. It's not fundamentalism. None of that has anything to do with the canonical tradition of the Orthodox Church. It's a medicinal one. Uh, and that's where we say this is the importance of understanding akrivia, which means like strictness, versus economia, which people tend to think means relaxed. It doesn't mean that. It's an economy. It's how do you take this and apply it for the purposes of the best healing? Speaking of theology is not merely an exercise in rational thinking, intellectual theorizing, or mental reflection on metaphysics. Theology is a divine revelation, God's revelation of himself by himself to those who with spiritual eyes have been purified to receive his divine light. Thanks for sharing that, George. That's such a beautiful quote. It removes us from orthodoxy being a thing up here to understand, and in the words of Callistos, we're into a mystery that we're increasingly becoming aware of. We're finally going back to the fathers and to the faith on which was founded on the cross, a visible one. Writings in the lives of the church fathers and mothers. There's a great quote that uh, I just read again by Frederica Matthew Green. She's picked it up from other people. 100% of the church fathers are right 80% of the time. <laughs> this might scandalize some people, but if you think about it, you come into a church, we are Orthodox Christians. We're not Chrysostomians. We're not Gregorians. We're not, you know, certainly not Anselmians. We're Orthodox which means we don't take any one father and go, absolutely, everything that this guy ever said was true. That's not what the making of a saint. A saint is allowed to write something that we go, hey, I don't know if that quite fits with the tradition of the church. Maybe there's a mystery there. It's about the person. What is their relationship like with God? That's what makes a saint. And those saintly people, we pay a lot of attention to what they wrote. But we don't fall heir, you know. You, what you want to follow in a saint is their love for God, not the little idiosyncrasies they do. But we do rely on them for what they say, particularly those who have the theological education and the true theology, which is, you know, knowledge of God. Uh, but of course, for anybody who wants to know more about the church, we're going to get into this a lot. Father John Romanides uh, was a great priest, uh, died. Uh, it was in the 60s when he wrote a, a really great paper. He always says, go back to the fathers, go back to the fathers and mothers, go back to them, because these are the people who have been illuminating the scriptures because they've always seen them through Christ's eyes. Finally, spiritual guide. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had a charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Class, by the way, there's a plug there coming up in a couple weeks. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. This is the most, by the way, this is so orthodox. I just love this. So Philip ran up to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And every person with a little bit of purity of heart and humility should respond this way. How can I, unless someone guides me? Mm -hmm. Immanuel Kant, God bless him, we don't weigh witches against geese anymore to see which one floats. That's a problem. But this idea of the enlightenment, which if you want to reduce it fairly or unfairly to him, which is, I can discern the truth for myself. Okay, there's, there's something that can be good out of that. That's also a dangerous statement. Not true. And we live in a world where everybody says, well, it's my truth and her truth and that truth. There's just the truth. There's the truth. Everybody has their own perspectives, and that's okay. But there's the truth. And the way that we come to know it, so we don't have 26,000 denominations of Orthodox like we see in the West. God bless them. That's not a statement of being mean, but for those of us seeking the truth, the reason that we have one is because everybody gathered together. The whole thing was opened up liturgically prayed through, founded in the scriptures, focused on the person of Christ, and over the eons said, this is what has been handed to us, and it's meant to be untouched. And what's so neat about that is what you find in a, in a faith that's done that is not an increasing narrowing, but an actually growing vision of the whole world. The cosmos opens up. So for this purpose, I say it's important in the Orthodox world that we have a yeronda, which is, again, old man, but it's, it's, a, it's a respectful way of saying it. 
astounded is the way you could say it in the Slavic tradition, that we have confession, that we are talking to one another, that we have accountability partners, that we're going to people. And this, by the way, becomes difficult once you become Orthodox. This is where lots of people begin to stumble because now that they're in the faith, now that they're a part of it, they can fall prey going back to the religious stuff that they came, they ran away from the past, which is I need to look deodorized and sanitized and everything is perfect in my life. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Hello, Father. How are you doing? Everything is great. This is a mistake. Everybody who walks the door of that church, including the clergy or sinners, God loves us anyway. And so we need to continue to confess to one another to say, here's the sins. Here's what I'm struggling with. I'm a mess. And what you'll find is people go, so am I. <laughs> Let's go confess to the priest, because that priest has to go to confession too. So he knows what he's what it's all about too. There's a danger, and this is what I did said finish. There's a danger of cult personality. Um, we don't fall prey to that. Again, this is about the person of Christ. So it's not about Father Andrew, Father Jacob. Thank God it's not about Father Jacob. It's it's the whole church. It's what's been handed to us. And in that in instance, there's a healthy obedience of monasticism. I mean, technically speaking, one of the things that people can fall into, I'm so sorry, 7.30. Are we good for another five minutes? Ten minutes, sorry. We can fall prey, for instance, and my spiritual father is, uh, is, is himself a monk from Mount Athos, is a bishop, but we can fall prey, and he's a person to point this out too, into becoming religious. I mispronounce it on purpose. We become religious. And I see a guy over there in an all-black outfit, what is no different than the outfit somebody bought at Macy's. It's just cloth. And because he's got a long beard and his way over there, that guy's holy. I'm going to do whatever he says. That's a danger. And the people who know it the best are a lot of my friends who are monks on Mount Athos. And my spiritual father is a monk himself. And you say, there's nothing holier because I'm over here. And a lot of ways, what you see in monasticism, yes, is a very holy call to people. Monasticism we need. Monasticism supports the church. Monastics have poured out holy people around us. But sometimes we don't notice the holy people around us, you know, say our yayas, our grandmothers, because they dress like the rest of us. And we woke up in the same house with them. But their prayers and their sacrifice and their holiness and their fidelity to God were the foundations of homes. Those are saints. So we don't want to fall prey to this religious thing. We're like, well, the saints are over at that monastery. I'm friends with several of them, so they know I'm not attacking them. I love you guys. <laughs> but they'll have the same feeling. They'll say, you have a community of believers. Go to that community. There's even a, a canon that you're not supposed to go to confess at monasteries. It's a canon to people who talk about canons. You know, it's meant to be done in, in the community. So we have to guard ourselves a little bit. Yes, it's very good to go to monasteries. It's good to meet with these people. Their lifestyle is wonderful. But if I give you a little thing about obedience, which is on your handout here, about a healthy obedience, that obedient thing, it's not saying too much, is really just a reflection of what you see in marriage. If anybody here is married, you know how this goes. You end up being obedient to one another. You serve one another. You have days where you struggle with one another. You fight about things. You disagree about things. And in that, in that, you're actually working out your salvation. God has put this person in your life to save your life, as we say at all the weddings. And if I will just shut up and listen to my wife, she'll save my life. And my wife is so sweet. She'll say the same thing. If I'll just shut up and listen to my husband, maybe. It'll save my life. That's what marriage is. Now, okay, abuse is something very different. That's that's a very different conversation. But I mean in the day-to-day, -day, like we need each other. But in that, that's a healthy sense of obedience. And you all know this just as well as I do. Some of you have kids. You dropped off your daughter. She's in Arizona, her first year there. They're going to check your will. I'm trying to think of how many football games I've tried to watch for my sons. Like, we're going to watch Blippi. If you guys don't know who Blippi is and you're about to have kids, good Lord, I'm so sorry. It checks your will. It robs you of your selfishness. And at first, I have a tyrant like a child. Like, I want it my way. And then I realize, wait a second, this kid's saving my life. I'm in danger of becoming a human being. What I want to do and my plans and my projects are all suspended. I'm in danger of becoming a human being if I love this little guy, you know? You have to recreate that in a cinematic community. Because I could go out to the desert by myself and live in my own delusion. I'm perfect, I'm great, I'm fine. But when you go to a monastery, they put you under obedience of somebody precisely to teach you that that's not how it works. You're going to bump into other monks. You're going to struggle. You're going to have tough days. Your spiritual father is going to say, do this, and then tell you to do that. And that's why the saying is, in the monasteries of Sinai and Mount Athos, if you want to be a good monk, be a good married person, because a good married person would make a good monk.
-hmm. That's it. And, and the monks, literally the humble ones are so sweet. Welcome to Orthodoxy, by the way. Ask a married person, I want to be super holy. What should I do? Go to a monastery. Talk to some of the monks in Mount Athos like I did at Vatopedi. This young man said, I want to be really holy. I should be here. And the story is funny. I know I've told you guys a lot before about the valley. Okay, it's worth it. A young man was talking this related to my father, Tim, or Dr. Tim Petitsis. You monks here, you're doing it. This is the holy way. How do you do it? I mean, at least you're living it out. You're walking it out. And this, there's two monks that were sitting there, an older gentleman who's probably maybe in his 80s. And a younger monk was probably in his 40s. And the younger monk is like a little John figure. He's a big guy. And he's looking at this older monk, smiling at him. And this older monk goes, yes, yeah, this is the holy way. And he said, what's it like? He goes, it's like being at one end of a valley, and I've got to get to the other end of the valley. And there is quicksand and snakes and robbers and all kinds of death and animals and it's scary and venomous stuff. And the young man said, yeah, but at least you're doing it. And he said, this is true. The monastic life, eyes wide open, the demons know what's up, you know what's up. You're here, you're dedicated your life for the whole world. We, by the way, the church is incomplete without the monks. We need them. We really need those monastics. But this young man goes, man, boy, why are you married? What is the married life? And that's when this monk looks at him with this smile on his face. And he said, it's the same thing, but at night. <laughs> he said, that's a holy call. And he said, because without my parents, there is no monk sitting in front of you to tell you the story. It's like, so perfectly orthodox. Go to a monk. I want to be holy. Get married. Go to married people. I want to be holy. What do I do? Go be a monk. Whatever goodness you think you can do and you can offer to God, if you think you can be a married person, you should do it. I, um, I hesitate to share some of this, but I think it's important. There are certain people that you're going to see online who I think, God forgive me, we do have to say some names. But I would say you probably need to guard yourself from listening to. There, there's a wide variety of people you can listen to that are incredible. Father Thomas Hopko, who I mentioned a couple of times, he's nicknamed the gold standard. Uh, his students used to pick one because of all the talks he gave. He always tends to kind of say the same thing at the very end. And anytime he gave a talk, his students would say, what is he calling it this time? He's amazing. Father John Baer is a giant. Schmemann, Romanides, Meyendorf, there's a whole host of them. Florovsky, St. Um, you know, Sophroni. Like, there, there are so many people. Um, who's the elder in uh, Essex right now after whom Sophroni was? Elder Zacharias. Elder Zacharias is incredible. There's a lot of them. But there are some people who would say, hey, guard yourselves. And I hesitate to say this because I don't mean this as any judgment against them. But, like, for instance, someone like a father Peter Hears, God bless him, is not somebody who you should be going to to learn about the Orthodox tradition. That's not me saying it because I've got some personal hubris or something. But th those, those are the words of bishops. We're saying where the man is right now, probably not a, a good thing to do. Uh, people I know very often are big fans of, I'm not categorizing these in the same space. This is just, I, you know, people say, for instance, they enjoy reading Sarah from Rose. Sarah from Rose is a really beautiful life story, but not all of this theology is perfect. And so I'd say, kind of be careful about, about some of that stuff too. This is, by the way, the importance of, reading scripture over and over and over again, talking to a spiritual father. There's a lot of stuff you see. I'm not just trying to sing about those guys. But there's you know, a whole group. You see this thing called the Orthodox Meme Squad online. Now I'm talking to everybody who's under the age of 30. You have to be careful about that. Um, Theoria has some great stuff, but also some stuff that requires discernment. You even find some things with, um, uh, is it Pro Publica? What's the one that out of Fordham? Public Orthodoxy has some great stuff. But some stuff they put in there, too, where you're going, okay, this kind of airs in a different direction. And by the way, all of these people I'm mentioning, I would not deny any of these people aren't Christians. So it kind of makes us unique as Orthodox. We're not saying this person's terrible. But say just, as far as those of you who are coming into the faith, to kind of guard yourself as you're coming in going, okay, if this person comes up, I'm going to listen. But I need to, I need to listen with a discerning ear. Um, a guy named Brother Nathaniel is another guy who has kind of had some struggles. Actually, in his case, it's, it's a, I think it's probably a medical issue. He, he does pretty well when he's on medication. These are kind of the big ones that you kind of see. Um, I would guard a lot of young men. Discord and Reddit is probably not the place you want to go about learning orthodoxy. Again, I'm talking to everybody now at the age of 30. Um, they become kind of echo chambers. The, the danger that can happen there is it does become a place where people are just arguing, well, this church father and this kin and this, okay, that we're not talking about orthodoxy anymore. You know, it's not to say we should get away from those entirely, but all the stuff I said in summary 
having a spiritual guide, returning to the fathers. If a person wants to read the fathers, you don't need to read one in the 20th century, although that's fantastic. I would say read Ignatius, read Clement, read Polycarp, read the shepherd of Hermas, read Clement, read some of these guys who are there right after Christ. Irenaeus of Lyon would be amazing. The councils and the creeds, it has to hold muster with them. Is it something that we have professed in the council and the creeds? And if it's not, then it's not something a person is required to believe to be orthodox. Worship and prayer, it has to be something that's articulated in, in the worship and prayer. Scripture and tradition, scripture, it always comes back to the Holy Scriptures. Founded in the, in the life of the church. And it's always, always, always the hermeneutical key is Jesus Christ himself. I know I went over by 10 minutes at 740. Uh, and again, I don't mean to offend anybody who might be a fan of some of the people I mentioned. There, there are a few others, but the reason I bring that up is I know many, especially young converts, have been kind of drawn to them, which has been great because it's kind of brought them in. But it's also good to have a little bit of discernment. I think a lot of young people know that, just about what's being said there. And I would say to those people, where do I go? Back to the scriptures, back to the fathers, back to the councils, back to worship and prayer and purity of heart and fasting and all that kind of stuff. So through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Thank you all online for being with us. Amen.